Clear prop. Hello ladies and gentlemen, Central here. Hope you guys are having a wonderful day as always. Today, actually hold on one minute, just give me a minute, just a minute. There we go. Different video, different shirt. Certainly wouldn't want you to think that I'm filming two separate videos on the exact same day at the same place at the same time. We're certainly not doing that at all. Anyway, today we're going to be taking another look at the GI-275 that I had installed into my airplane. A lot of you wanted a little more detail on the engine monitor, so that's what we're going to be taking a look at today. And fortunately, we can actually look at some of the engine monitor here in the hangar before we go and take a look at it in flight. So, let's go ahead and uh, get started. So here we are in the cockpit, and like I said, there's a lot that we can look at here in the hangar before we even leave the ground. So first and foremost, to turn the unit on, you've got to turn the battery on. Now it may get a little noisy in here because we're going to have the gyro spinning up. However, as you can see, the Garmin is the only instrument that at this point in time has started working, and that's because all of the others are on the Avionics Master. When you see this first page come up here, you'll notice that it says fuel remaining zero. That's because I haven't inputted any fuel. Now, I've just done my pre-flight on this airplane, you know, preparing to go and fly. So, if I go ahead and click here, I can enter the amount of fuel that I have on board. And I'm going to put what I've got as usable fuel. So, right now, we've got uh, 42, well, we've got 42.2. We'll say 42 gallons. So 42 gallons of usable. After you enter your fuel remaining, you can press continue. And that's going to bring you up to your uh, engine monitor page. The first page has all of your major instruments on it. And this is what's great about this unit. It reduces your scan because you don't have engine instruments all over the place anymore. You know, I used to have separate instruments for all of these, for the RPM, the oil pressure, the oil temperature. Um, I didn't even have CHT. I did have EGT. Uh, your fuel flow I didn't have. So your, your amps and, and uh, battery voltage, that, those were separate instruments. This would have all been scattered all over the place uh, previously, but now it's all nice and, and neat in one package, so greatly reduces your scan. Now, uh, the thing about the uh, GI-275 is that the EIS isn't the only 275, so you've got two knobs here. This one doesn't really do anything, the uh, outer one. That's because this is the EIS model. If I had one that was, let's say, replacing an artificial uh, horizon or your AI um, or your DG or one of these radios down here, you'd be able to use both of these knobs because, of course, you'd need to be able to change uh, settings, heading bugs, um, that sort of thing. So that those instruments, you know, are going to make use of both of these. With the EIS, you've only got this knob here because all you're doing is getting information from this. So on the second page, this is going to give us uh, our fuel pressure, uh, carburetor temperature, which was an extra. That's something that I wanted added. Your next page shows you your EGTs for all four cylinders, in my case, since I've got a four-cylinder engine. And right now, even with the engine off, the uh, temperatures are showing up here. This is in Fahrenheit. Then you've got your cylinder head temperatures, same deal. And then you've got your uh, fuel page. Now the fuel page, this is going to give information based on your navigator. So I've got a GI, uh, or uh, excuse me, a GNX 375 in here. And if I were to input a flight plan, it would give me an endurance range and all that based on that information. Uh, right now though, it's just going to show the estimated fuel. And once fuel starts flowing, it'll it'll give you that information also as far as your, uh, your estimated uh, endurance and range and your destination information on the right hand side. Okay, so we're going to take a look at this in terms of a uh, complete startup. Now one of the startup items is to make sure that the uh, fuel booster pump is working. So we're actually going to have to go to the second page here. So on our auxiliary p uh, page we have our fuel pressure and PSI. We're going to go ahead and turn on the fuel booster pump and make sure that, that comes up. And that looks normal. We're just a little bit over 5 PSI. So that's good. We'll turn that back off. And we'll go through our, our uh, 
standard uh, startup procedure here. I'm going to go back to the main page, and what we're looking for is we're looking for oil uh, pressure and oil temperature. Those are very critical. We want to see that uh, oil pressure come up, and then uh, slowly, of course, that oil temperature is going to come up. So we're going to be watching those after we start, and as well as the others, fuel flow and whatnot, but those are the uh, critical ones. You'll see here there's a little yellow mark on the RPM gauge. That's where I want to keep my RPMs for startup, uh, which is going to be between 1,000 and uh, 1,200 RPM. So that's what we're looking for as far as uh, uh, just idle while we're warming up the engine. And that's really what we need, actually, to, to get this engine warm. Now, the oil pressure uh, PSI scale, that's a little off. I'm going to have to get that adjusted. What you'll notice is later on, especially after the engine has warmed up and we're coming into land somewhere, you're going to see the oil pressure actually indicating uh, low. So right now we've got an oil temperature warning. Um, that's because, of course, the engine isn't running, so the oil temperature is low. However, the oil pressure, we're going to get that same kind of warning for oil pressure once the engine's warm and we're at low power. Um, that's normal. That's actually not an issue. Um, but it's going to drop below 60 PSI, which is where it's set now. I'm thinking about dropping it about 10 PSI, and hopefully that'll take care of the, that'll take care of the issue. But uh, that's for another day. So let's go ahead and get started here. I'm going to turn the fuel booster pump back on. And we're going to uh, start the engine. Clear prop. So I'm about to do the run-up here, and you can go ahead and already see what I was talking about. You see, I've got an oil pressure warning here, and that's because the oil temperature has come up. So we're in the green arc on oil temperature now, but the oil pressure has dropped because the viscosity has dropped, and uh, that's even at uh, a little over 1,000 RPM. So we can go ahead and acknowledge that if we want to. Not necessary, but you can go ahead and acknowledge it by clicking on it. Uh, again, like I said, I'm going to eventually get that adjusted. So I'm going to go ahead and do the run-up now, and then we'll get ready for uh, takeoff. That's one of the reasons I wanted that uh, extra sensor for carburetor temperature. I don't get much of a drop on this plane for some reason for the uh, carburetor heat. Fortunately, I live in a fairly warm climate. However, uh, that is something eventually I'll probably want to get looked at. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and take off now. I'll uh, just let you watch that instrument and see what happens uh, under takeoff power. And in the climb, we'll take a look at CHTs and whatnot. So. As we're climbing out here, one thing to note is the cylinder head temperature. It's actually fairly high at uh, 437, which is on cylinder number three. We can tell it's number three. I don't know if you can see it on the camera, but uh, that indicator says that cylinder number three is the warmest. We'll flip over. Oops, too far. And we can see here again, cylinder three is the hottest, or at least it's the critical one. Cylinder one is now the, the critical one, so it's changed over. And sure enough, it's changed over there as well. I'm going to go ahead and pull back on the power and start leveling off, see if we can get that temperature down. I really don't want it that high. 
unnecessarily. Uh, a lot of people don't like going over 400 degrees on the cylinders. 500 is the absolute maximum temperature uh, for a, a cylinder of this type, which uh, again you can see on this chart here there's a red line at 500 degrees. Um, but again, once you get into cruise, typically this drops down to 400 or less for this aircraft. So that's what we're going to be looking at once we get into cruise. We're coming up to 2,000 feet. I'll probably level off at 2,000 and we'll fly at that altitude. Quite turbulent today. Alright, 2,000 feet. I'm going to start a power reduction and we'll lean the engine out as well. Fuel booster pumps coming off. Our exhaust gas temperatures around the 1500 degree mark. VHTs should start dropping off and they are dropping. And down here again we can see our EGT. Alright. We'll bring the mixture back up until the EGT peaks. Okay, it's dropping off there. We'll bring it back down. And we're just lean a peak. And those CHTs will continue to drop off. And as you can see, we've got our Fuel estimated now at 40 gallons because we burned off some with an endurance of a little over four hours. And our gallons per hour right now are just a little over nine gallons per hour, so that's what I would expect at 2300 RPM. Yep, it's pretty accurate. So unfortunately the cockpit audio for the landing phase didn't get recorded. I don't know if that was a mistake I made or if it was an equipment failure, but either way I'm going to have some post commentary for you here. So we can again see that we're at 2300 RPM here, about 2000 feet MSL, and the cylinder head temperatures have dropped off below 400 degrees and that's really what I wanted to point out here. Uh, if you watched my last video, you know that I descended, uh, did some low approaches at a, uh, an airfield called Marlboro County, uh, and then of course flew back to home base, and on the way back, of course, I'm, I'm looking at all this again. I had to re-lean, of course, because I reclimbed, and uh, the fuel flow uh, came down to book values. It was hovering right around 8.7 uh, for 2300 RPM, which is economy cruise, so that was good. And, uh, of course, the cylinder head temperatures and EGTs came down to where I really want to see them. So this is what you can expect, uh, or at least what I can expect, on a, uh, a economy cruise cross-country type situation, uh, the kind of numbers that I want to look for. And, of course, whenever you get an engine monitor like this, it's not going to do you any good unless you actually utilize it. So uh, as part of uh, your regular scan, every few minutes you're probably going to want to go through and just take a look and, and make sure that all of the uh, cylinder head temperatures and EGTs are, are where you want to see them and they're not climbing or, or uh, dropping off uh, unusually. Uh, now anything that is going to be a high reading of course is going to show up on your main page here so if there was a cylinder going high all of a sudden that would definitely show up. Uh, if one was getting a little cool though you're, you're probably going to need to be scanning to find that. So. Uh, but again, at least everything's all in one place. It's not scattered across the instrument panel. Now, as you can see, I'm starting my descent here to come into land. And what I want you to keep an eye out for is when I'm making my uh, base to final turn, 
I want you to look at the oil pressure warning so that's going to come up again uh, like I said I think maybe a drop of about 10 psi uh, on that uh, bar graph there should let me know um, yeah, or, or that is to say should keep it down to where I'm not going to be getting that alarm anymore and after I land you'll see that when I bring the engine back to absolute idle which it's idling somewhere around uh, 800 870 rpm um, the PSI drops to about 52 PSI so if I drop the uh, the warning down 10 PSI I think it should go away at least for landing as far as the book values on the engine again 60 PSI in in cruise in flight that's the minimum you want to see but whenever you're you know coming in for approach or at idle you know the the engine can go down according to the book down to as, as low as 25 psi so yeah I definitely could could see dropping off that uh, that yellow yellow bar to uh, to about 50 psi should be fine And it was quite turbulent this day. That flow state stabilization on the camera uh, is doing a pretty good job. It's almost as good as a gimbal. Keeping the picture fairly steady. And there we go, I'm reducing RPM again. So at this point I am uh, coming on to downwind. So we'll be landing shortly here. All right, so actually here I'm turning, so I'm entering my uh, rounded base. And there you go, you can see the oil pressure warning has come back because the RPM has dropped off enough and, and the viscosity of the oil is low enough that it's uh, come down below 60 PSI. Making a fairly steep approach here. So the uh, RPMs came back up just from the, the prop windmilling. I'm not actually adding power, but the uh, prop is windmilling there a little bit. And there we go, as the RPM drops off again, we get the uh, warning coming back. In addition to the turbulence, there was a rather strong wind out of the west, or the southwest. So it was almost right down the runway, and I was able to make a really short landing because I had a good strong headwind. And there we go. As you can see, the RPMs uh, now at, at uh, proper idle. We're getting about 52 psi. So again, I think I can drop it off by about 10. So I hope you enjoyed that look at the GI275 EIS. It's an expensive little bit of kit. It took a long time to get it installed but it does provide a considerable amount of peace of mind and there's not a whole lot to it on the operation side as you can see it's basically the, just there to give me more information and a little more confidence when I'm making especially long distance flights so I know that uh, the engine is you know healthy and happy um, when I'm not necessarily close to a runway or if something's going wrong you know I can divert so that's the idea behind the uh, engine monitor and why I got it also it replaced some older instruments that I was afraid might fail so that's good as well. Less uh, things to look at as far as a scan. Obviously, everything's all in one place now, so that's nice. So there's a lot of benefits, and that's why I got it. Anyway, hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. As always, like, comment, all that YouTube stuff, and I'll catch you guys later. Thanks for watching. Guess I can put my green shirt back on now. <laughs>